Hi everybody, this is Miss Peachy from your WCA Physics class, and I am going to go through your lesson three, um, unit three, conservation of mechanical energy laboratory. This is a revised recording because the um, online simulator has changed somewhat, and I just want to make sure that you are not confused with the new version of the online sim. A um, couple things before we begin. First of all, I also want to emphasize to you the use of the rubric that is found on my website. So if you go to my website, which is accessible by going to the uh, message boards and clicking kind of all the way through my message boards till you get to the link, which I would recommend that you then, you know, make a favorite so you can easily access it in the future. If you come to the website, then you'll be on this home page. From here, click on the physics tab and then scroll down to general stuff and click on the lab rubric and that will bring you to this document which is a um, Google Doc that kind of goes through the different sections that you need to include, include in your lab write-up and then how those sections are assessed. So the first part talks about an introduction slash hypothetical. Um, introduction should be pretty self-explanatory, but the hypothetical, you'll notice if I go back to slide one of this lesson, it says the slide will demonstrate the principles behind the law of conservation of mechanical energy as your textbook explains mechanical energy is never created or destroyed but it can be converted to one form or another in this lab you will study what happens when mechanical energy is converted between elastic potential energy and gravitational potential energy using a mass on a spring okay so first design an experiment you could conduct that might measure elastic and potential energy and gravitational potential energy. So if you were to make up a lab to do at home, or let's say you had some equipment you wanted to you know, use to do this, what might you do? Something that would demonstrate both elastic and gravitational energy, okay? So talk about that, talk about the materials you would use, the measurements you would take, what results you would expect, and you know, what kind of ways in which you could make mistakes. So that last question is, what if the results were different? What would that indicate? And sometimes I get people say that would indicate that, you know, energy is not conserved, but that's not true because that's a law. <laughs> so that it can't change the laws of physics. There's probably something wrong with your experiment. And don't just say that I did something wrong. Tell me kind of what you did wrong, what you think you may have done wrong. What are some ways in which people could screw up doing this lab? Think about the components, right? You have um, the setup of the lab. You have taking data and measurements. You have calculations that you're doing. You have the equipment itself. There's so many facets where error could be introduced, and that's what you got to think about. All right, that being said, I'm um, going back to the lab rubric. The second section is the hypothesis. On the hypothesis, this is not just an educated guess, but it is a way for you to use your current understanding of physics to back up what you think will happen. So I think this will happen because this is my explanation, what I think is going on. And according to my textbook, this is the principle that should support my hypothesis. So definitely reference your book, use MLA citations, and get used to using text-based evidence to support your claims in science, okay? Your data tables should be organized and labeled properly. Make sure that you're using the correct units of measure. In this particular portfolio, you will be measuring in centimeters and um, grams, but you need the measurements in meters and kilograms so make sure you're doing those conversions and that you are giving the data in the correct units your graph should be labeled on both the x and y axes they should have labels and units of measure as well as a title and a best fit line on the graph um, in addition you will have an analysis of that graph a verbal explanation of what the graph is showing graphs are supposed to show relationships how does one variable affect another? So you need to make sure that you are showing or you're describing and explaining the relationship that the graph is showing. 
Additionally, if you are doing calculations, then those should be done in the analysis section. Should never be a mystery how you arrived at a particular number. If there's anything beyond what data you've taken physically, you're calculating, for example, K value in this particular portfolio, you want to make sure that you use um, and show your calculations in the analysis. And finally, the conclusions. In the conclusion section, you are going to make a connection back to your hypothesis, but you are also going to answer the questions that were given to you in the lesson. So please put the question, highlight that question, and then write the answer beneath it. And don't forget that when you are reflecting upon your hypothesis that you should be using text-based evidence to support your conclusion. Okay, that being said, going back to the portfolio, the next thing it's going to have you do is to click on, excuse me, I'm trying to get this window to drag over, the masses and spring link to bring you to the simulator. Now this is what the sim looks like in the lesson. This is what it looks like in real life. They look very different from each other. I'm going to reset this one real quick here actually. You'll first arrive at this window and I want you to click on intro and then it looks like this. They look a little, I mean, there's a lot of similarities but there's some differences as well, okay? So here you have your masses, your springs. Don't adjust the spring constant at this time. Here you have some um, controls over on the right. And I want to have you click on natural length and a movable line for now. And then realize you also have a ruler, you have a timer, and you have the ability to slow down the oscillation and pause it temporarily because that's something you will need. First thing I want you to do is to measure the distance between the ground and the resting place of the spring with no mass. So I'm going to bring that ruler over and I'm going to measure from the blue line, which is the resting place, down to the ground, which is right where those masses are resting. And I come up with about 95 centimeters. Remember, convert that to meters, so that's 0.95 meters. That's the first thing you need to do. And then you're going to put a 50 gram mass onto the spring and you're going to measure its resting place. And this is a bit tricky. Well, it's not really that tricky, but it's not very self-explanatory. So when you let it go, it's just going to keep oscillating, blah, 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 never stop. But if I click on the little red stop here, it'll mark its resting position or its equilibrium position. And so I'm going to click on this marker and it gives me a green line to measure its equilibrium position. So let's do a couple of things here. Let me go back to the, the data table. So you're going to set up a data table. And hang on a second, I'm going to bring this over and bring this over here so it's a little easier for me to see. You're going to set up a data table. And the first trial, your mass was 50 grams, 0 0.05 kilograms. The stretched spring. Um, that's what we are measuring right now, okay? Hang on a sec. Okay, so that, that stretched spring is going to be what we're measuring right now, but before we do that, you're going to put down somewhere by the data table, you're going to put down the length of, from the spring, its resting point without a mass, to the ground. So, Spring, I'm just going to write spring initial position here, and that was that 0.95 meters, just because we'll need that later, okay? So then I'll go back to this, where is it? This one here. And I'm going to measure its equilibrium position, which is, I think it's like 8 centimeters, it looks like to me. And that's going to go here, and 8 centimeters is, what, like 0 0.08 meters? Okay. Now I'm going to look at its oscillation. I'm going to um, allow this thing to oscillate by pushing it up, holding it at the blue line where it normally would start without a mass, and then letting it bounce around. Okay. So I'm going to, it's just going to keep doing this because there's no friction in this particular sim. I'm going to slow this down. And I'm going to pause it when it gets to its high spot and measure that. 
So it looks like its high spot to me is zero centimeters. So its highest point of oscillation here is zero for this one, okay? And then when I go to, I continue it here, I push play again. Its lowest point of oscillation, and this one I'm going to use the red line, I'm going to move it so I can see better. Doesn't that look like 15? 15 centimeters, right? So low point is 0.15 meters, okay? Now I've made my data table bigger because later on you're going to actually add additional things, an additional data table, and I felt like it was just felt made more sense to put it all in one data table. Because you're going to do these measurements for trial two and trial three using different masses, okay? Don't think you actually need these three rows. You only need three rows, okay? But you're going to also then calculate K value and a couple other calculations here. And remember, guys, since you're calculating here, these are things you're going to put in your analysis section as calculations. So K value, if we go ahead a little bit here, um, which is this? K value, we're going to move ahead to the next screen, takes force and divides by stretch spring. Now, this is where people get messed up again, too, because force is newtons. So K value here Okay. So for your first trial, trial one, Okay, the force, or excuse me, the um, mass of it is 0 0.05 kilograms, right? 0 0.05 kilograms. Can't type, apparently. Um, and then you multiply that times 9.81 meters per second per second to give you your force in newtons, okay? So 0 0.05 times 9.81 equals 0.49 newtons. Okay, then the length of the stretch spring is 0 0.08. Okay. So then you take um, 0.49 divided by 0 0.08 to give you 6.1, which is the K value here. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So you're going to do that for all three trials. Okay. Then you need to calculate elastic potential energy high, elastic potential energy low, okay? Gravitational potential energy high, gravitational potential energy low. And then you're going to add this column here and this column here to get the total potential energy on the high point. And you're going to add this column here and this column here, or I'm sorry, this column here to get the total potential energy on the low point. If energy is conserved, your total potential energy at the high mark and at the low mark should be the same, okay? If they're not the same, then energy is not being conserved and you're doing something wrong. But that's how you're gonna do your calculations. And I just like them all in one data table rather than having them in separate data tables. To me, it just seems to be an easier way to work on calculations. 
All right, so hopefully that helps out a lot. Um, if you guys have any questions or concerns, please feel free to give me a call or send me a webmail message. Have a great day.